All right. Hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to host today's seminar. Um, today's seminar is hosted by the Helmholtz Institute for RNA-Based Infection Research in Würzburg, Germany. I am Neva Chalishkan, and I'll be moderating the seminar today. We'll have two talks by Chase Beisel and Emanuel Zaliba. The talks will be about 20, 25 minutes, followed by five to 10 minutes of question and answer. I suggest that you type in your questions in the chat window and as the talks are progressing and I'll be reading them aloud. And you can always ask questions um, by email or we'll post your questions by email and uh, you'll get answers afterwards. All right, um, with that, I see people are still coming in. We'll let them in still, but uh, perhaps we'll just start with our first speaker. Our first speaker is Chase Beisel. Chase has completed his doctoral study at the California Institute of Technology um, in 2009. And then he did a two-year postdoc by Gigi Storz in at the NIH um, uh, before uh, starting his own group at the North Carolina State University between 2011 and 2017. Chase worked as an assistant professor and afterwards as an associate professor. And in 2018, he joined Helmholtz Institute for RNA-Based Infection Research um, as a W2 professor. And he also holds a professorship at the medical faculty um, of uh, medical faculty at the University of Würzburg. His group focuses on RNA engineering and CRISPR technologies. Uh, with that, I would like to welcome Chase. All right. Well, thank you for the uh, introduction, Neva, and thank you all for joining online. And it's really excited to be participating in this uh, RNA seminar series. Okay, so today what I'm gonna do is tell you just a little bit about what my group does, but otherwise focus on a really exciting um, story that we've wrapped up, um, but so far is unpublished, all about these really fascinating adaptive immune systems in bacteria and archaea and how they deal with some of the issues that arise with adaptive immunity. And this work was all done by uh, Chen Yu Liao, a really fantastic postdoc in my group. So uh, for this audience, especially with uh, an RNA inclination, uh, probably know at least one or a few things about CRISPR. Um, but it's normally in the context of CRISPR as a tool for genome surgery, where you can go in and change virtually any genome or DNA sequence at will. And this is done with a combination of a CRISPR nuclease like Cas9, as well as a programmable single guide RNA. And the idea is that this RNA directs Cas9 to matching DNA targets. Cas9 can cut those, and that initiates the editing process to result in your final edit. And so despite um, all the fanfare and excitement and visibility of CRISPR as a technology, it's worth recognizing that it wasn't invented in a research lab, it was discovered. And it was discovered as an adaptive immune system found in bacteria and archaea, and its job is to fend off foreign invaders. And it's been truly fascinating, um, not only because it's the only known adaptive immune system in prokaryotes, but it's also incredibly diverse and can see a wide range of proteins, mechanisms, and functions, all of which can give rise to new technologies. And so my group has really been dedicated at this interface between CRISPR biologies and or biology and technologies. And so the work that we've done over the past, I guess, decade has focused on developing new characterization tools to accelerate how we work with CRISPR, interrogating the biology of these adaptive immune systems, and then also developing a wide range of technologies. Um, but for today, I'll specifically focus on the biology of CRISPR and some of the insights we're trying to gain into how these adaptive immune systems evolved and function. So for those of you less familiar with CRISPR as an immune system, I just wanna walk through the, the basic steps. So these systems are composed of sets of these CRISPR-associated or Cas genes, as well as these CRISPR arrays of alternating conserved repeats and then uh, unique spacers. And so the way adaptive immunity comes about is these systems can grab a snippet of an invading genetic material and incorporate that as a new spacer within the CRISPR array. And then one of those repeats is copied to maintain this alternating pattern. 
Now that array is then transcribed and then processed into individual CRISPR RNAs. And then those form a complex with the effector nucleases associated with that system. And this RNP then runs around the cell looking for complementary nucleic acid sequences. And when it finds one, that instructs the nuclease to cleave that sequence. And so the end result is that because this sequence matches up to the, an original invader, the system is now primed to recognize and cleave that same invading sequence, even if it appears far, far into the future. And so that in a crux is how the system functions as an adaptive immune system. But at the same time, as an adaptive immune system, there's some real challenges that it faces based on these functionalities. Now, the one that I think most people are familiar with comes with any adaptive immune system. And that's how to deal um, or the potential of autoimmunity and self-targeting. And so for CRISPR, this can come about by grabbing a piece of genomic DNA as a spacer. And the end result is that the system will now be instructed to attack the cell's own genome as if it were for an invader, and as you'd imagine, proves to be lethal. And so here there's some evidence, for instance, that these systems preferentially grab DNA from foreign elements versus its own genomic DNA that's helped resolve some of this particular problem. But the problem that I actually want to focus on today is a lesser known or considered one which is the problem of having too much memory. And so for CRISPR, this would be in the form of having too many spacers st stored within a CRISPR array. So to illustrate this, first think about a scenario where you just have two spacers in your array. And so you're gonna end up with a lot of CRISPR RNAs encoding one of those two sequences. And so you now have a lot of RNPs in the cell primed to look for either of those invaders if it comes into the cell. Now, the other extreme is, let's say you have a massive array of up to hundreds of spacers, things that you can find naturally. And so if you end up getting CRISPR RNAs from each of those spacers, um, a, a given spacer will, or a CRISPR RNA will only be associated with just one or a few RNPs at most. And so that won't be enough to mount a really effective immune response. And so you end up having program defense across a wide range of invaders, but you're really only going to, you're gonna defend pretty poorly against any one of those. And so this is the particular problem that we were interested in. And so underlying this problem, as I alluded to, is the assumption that for this CRISPR array, you get an equal number of CRISPR RNAs associated with each spacer. And so you'd have the same number, whether it's coming from the newest acquired spacer, or the oldest spacer, and of course, everything else in between. And you could imagine that one simple way to address this is trying to shift this um, distribution one way or another. And in fact, this is what's been observed from the early days of CRISPR and observed over and over again, that this distribution is actually pretty strongly shifted and towards the end of the array with the newest spacer. And in many regards, this actually kind of makes sense because this would provide for a way to mount a robust response um, against a subset of potential invaders, but with a focus on the newest ones. And these are the ones that the cells will be most likely to encounter again, particularly in the near future. And other work um, from, the, from Luciano Marafini's group um, was able to back this up experimentally where they showed that you could take a spacer somewhere in the middle of the array, stick it at the beginning, and you see a really, really big boost in overall immune activity. So there really seems to be something to this idea of having many, many more CRISPR RNAs coming from the beginning of the array as a way of being able to prioritize defense against the newest invaders. The question though, that's uh, existed in the field for quite a while and was the focus of this project was what's the underlying mechanism? Why is it that you have all of these spacers and yet most of the CRISPR RNAs seem to be coming from the newest side of the array? So before answering this question, <laughs> I have to admit that we got really interested in this question in a really, really roundabout way where we were originally interested in the very first spacer in these CRISPR arrays. And so we were focused on um, the system from Streptococcus pyogenes. So this encodes the Cas9 that's widely used for CRISPR technologies. And the way these systems work is that they transcribe their CRISPR array into this long precursor CRISPR RNA. 
And then what happens is you have this extra RNA called the tracer RNA, and that hybridizes to each of these conserved repeats within this RNA. And that does two things. One is that serves as a really good substrate for RNAs3 to drive processing. But then that RNA duplex is also efficiently bound by Cas9, and that gives you your final RNP, where now your CRISPR RNA is guiding DNA targeting. And so the question was, is what's happening with this very first repeat? So on one hand, it's like any other repeat, should bind with the tracer RNA and give rise to a CRISPR RNA. But that CRISPR RNA is pretty unique. And the key thing is that the guiding sequence isn't part of a spacer that was derived from some invader. It's part of this upstream leader sequence that's always there and present as part of the array. And so it would seem counterintuitive that these systems could be creating a CRISPR RNA that's not guided from some invader acquired sequence. And so the question is, are these things actually forming or not? And what are they doing? And so as an aside, we, we call these extraneous CRISPR RNAs or ECR RNAs because they come from outside of the array. And the aside too is that we observe these originally with a different system entirely, and that is what inspired us to switch over to Streptococcus pyogenes. And so from some of the original work um, where the tracer RNA was discovered, it was pretty obvious from RNA-seq analysis that there wasn't an ECR RNA being formed, at least to not any appreciable degree. And of course, the question was, well, why is it not forming or is it appearing, especially since the known mechanism of CRISPR RNA biogenesis would dictate that there should be an ECR RNA. And so this really began this project where we moved everything over into E. coli to more rapidly um, evaluate this system. And so we stuck the entire system from Streptococcus pyogenes into a low copy plasmid. And then as part of our assay, we transform in plasmid DNA encoding targets um, for each of our spacers, as well as the putative ECR RNA. And what we can do is we can take those transformed cells and plate them right away on antibiotics. Or what we can do is we can Looks like I got muted at some point in there. Hopefully people didn't miss much. Anyway, carrying on where I was. Um, so in this uh, other approach, we can culture the cells without antibiotic selection and then plate them. And what we found is this gives more time for particularly weaker systems to act and we can get a much larger change in transformation efficiencies. And so we, we applied this to look at the activity of these putative ECR RNAs. Okay, so first of all, if you just create a target against the first spacer, you get really good activity based on about a thousand fold drop in your transformation under both of these conditions. If you now look at the ECR RNA target, you now see virtually no activity under standard conditions. And even these more sensitive conditions, you only get a little bit of clearance activity. And so the first thought was, well, maybe the ECR RNA is just a bad guide sequence as you find with some CRISPR systems. But then if you swap it in place of that first spacer, it's actually really, really active. And then we thought, well, maybe it's the long upstream sequence that's getting in the way. And so what we did is we replaced that first repeat with the tail end of an sgRNA. So now you don't have to worry about processing. And that actually gave pretty good activity, at least much better than our original ECR RNA. So that told us that there was something about this setup that was specifically repressing the biogenesis or activity of these ECR RNAs, and something interesting there. And so while considering lots of possibilities, uh, the postdoc Chun Yu ended up figuring out that that upstream leader region had a really strong propensity to form a, a stable secondary structure with that first repeat. And so we'll can recall this a leader repeat stem loop. And so this kind of made sense in a way because this sort of structure would end up blocking the tracer RNA from coming in, as you would see here with the, the second repeat, and that would prevent you from getting this ECR RNA. And so after we, we obtained these predictions, we were able to team up with uh, multiple people in our building at the University of Würzburg, uh, 
Neva included, um, as well as a really great student in her group, uh, but also Cynthia Sharma, um, who's part of the university. And um, through that initial work, we were able to, first of all, confirm this sort of structure through in vitro structural probing, um, but also with uh, Neva's help, we're able to use microscale thermophoresis to show that this structure really blocked hybridization with the tracer RNA. So that all seemed to match what we were thinking in that context. And so we wanted to go from there to take a more experimental approach by mutating um, the leader to disrupt this structure and evaluate how that impacts uh, plasma clearance. And this was the point when things started to get really interesting. So first of all, if you just stay focused on the ECR RNA, uh, we found that if you disrupted the, this um, predicted structure, you ended up getting a boost of activity of plasmid clearance. And so you can see this going from your native one, that's light blue, to the red one where it's now been mutated. But um, beyond that, what was the really interesting part was looking at what happened with all of the other spacers of the array. And so what we found was that these newest spacers ended up losing quite a bit of activity under these conditions. So you can see here for these, this first spacer, just under standard uh, plating, we went from really robust activity to basically no clearance whatsoever. And this change persisted even when we had this more sensitive outgrowth. And we saw this for the second and the third spacer as well to some degree. But if you went to those later spacers, there wasn't really any difference whatsoever. So this leader repeat stem loop we kind of stumbled across seemed to be connected with robust activity of these newest spacers in the array. And the aside is that, or in addition to this, we were also able to show that this carried forward to phage defense and particularly with different uh, spacer sequences. And so in this case, we're replacing that first spacer with a different sequence targeting M13 phage and could show that with our native leader, we had a really good defense based on the lack of placking. But the moment you introduce those mutations, you restored a lot of placking. So it's to say that if you mutated that leader, you really screwed up defense through that newest spacer. And so what we wanted to do from there was figure out, okay, well, what exactly is going on? And one of the really greatest insights came from again, teaming up with Cynthia, um, where we performed this really great technique um, in her group called RIPSeq. And this allows you to pull down a protein um, presumed to be binding RNAs. And then you can purify away those RNAs and subject them to next-gen sequencing and figure out what was actually bound. And this has been a great technique um, we've applied over and over again as part of a really fun ongoing collaboration. And so applying this to this particular system, what we found was that for our native leader, this first CRISPR RNA ended up being the most abundant bound CRISPR RNA compared to the ECRNA and basically everything else in the array. But the moment we introduced those mutations to the leader, we ended up really um, negatively or reducing the amount of that one CRISPR RNA. And then we saw lesser reduction as you went from there that mostly disappeared by the time you got to the end. So it at least seemed to indicate that by disrupting this particular structure with the leader in the first repeat, we were really impacting the abundance of these CRISPR RNAs. But of course, then what's the connection between these two? How does this structure upstream impact all of these RNAs downstream? And so we ended up um, performing a number of assays trying to figure out what is going on, um, but fortunately got some hints along the way. So one really, really strong hint came from using northern blotting to look at our various processing products from CRISPR RNA biogenesis. And so if you just use the native array, you know, our full length RNA would be all the way up here. Your processed CRISPR RNA would be down here. But the most abundant species we got was something right here, which we figured out was the leader all the way through the middle of that second repeat, which is where processing would take place. And so we are getting rapid accumulation of this intermediate processing product. So the question was, okay, well, what could that leader repeat formed in this upstream region be doing to drive this sort of processing? Another uh, hint that we had was what happened when we started mutating this leader repeat in different places. So for instance, if you just take this stem right here, like if you just flip it or do other changes that maintains that stem, everything is preserved as if it were the native sequence. 
But if you start messing with that upper region, this other stuff up here that originally we had just were ignoring, this is where we started seeing some major impacts and that ended up um, affecting um, plasma clearance as we had seen previously. And so what it seemed to suggest was that there was something about this sequence up here that was somehow driving processing through this second repeat. And so after considering and exploring many different mechanisms, we ended up um, with what I'll tell you about here. And basically the idea is that this upper part and particularly these loops have a propensity to base pair with this second repeat, creating a sort of long range pseudo knot. And the idea is that this second repeat on its own would actually form a pretty strong hairpin with the hypothesis that this in itself would disrupt tracer RNA binding. But through these sort of long range interactions, you could end up opening up that hairpin and potentially promoting tracer RNA binding. And so this was our hypothesis that we, we spent quite a bit of time exploring, uh, mostly through various mutations that would disrupt this interaction through the loops without messing up this secondary structure or putting in compensatory mutations within the repeat. And so we turned to our tried and true clearance assay where we found, first of all, that if we mutate these loops, again, shown here in red, we end up having a pretty negative impact on clearance through our um, newest spacers. Um, including here, as you can see, for spacer one between the dark blue and that dark red. And then, of course, we didn't really see any impact through those later spacers as we had seen before. And of course, the really important experiment for anyone studying RNA base pairing interactions is restoring that interaction. And so we did that by mutating the repeat, which was actually kind of complicated because we also had to mutate the tracer RNA to make sure the two matched up. And so the key thing is that if you just mutate the repeat alone, um, along with the tracer RNA, you end up losing all clearance activity whatsoever. However, if you then mutate the loops to restore that pseudonaut interaction, you end up getting at least partial restoration of that clearance activity. And so that was really strong support for us, this interaction, along with a number of other experiments we did. Okay, so the, the last um, experiments along these lines was trying to figure out whether the pseudonaut was actually promoting hybridization with the tracer RNA. And so this was again carried out through Nava's group, where we looked to see the interactions between this tracer RNA and this repeat with or without those mutations to these loop regions. And so what they found exactly fit with our expectations, where if you mutate those loops, you end up getting less binding with the uh, tracer RNA, suggesting that this sort of interaction was actually promoting tracer RNA binding. And so we ended up with this uh, model generally shown here, where this upstream region through transcription is able to fold into this stem loop that it can then interact with the second repeat. That promotes tracer RNA binding, and that ends up speeding up processing of this uh, second repeat that ends up giving you a much higher abundance of these CRISPR RNAs versus other ones coming off of the array. And so we think that this is the mechanism that's actually allowing for this uh, unique distribution of CRISPR RNAs, um, but also this prioritization against the newest invaders the system has encountered. So the last quick piece I'll tell you about quickly since I know I'm running shorter on time, um, was evaluating whether this extended beyond Streptococcus pyogenes and whether it represented something general for CRISPR. And so we teamed up with Sasha Weinberg at Leipzig University, as well as Rolf Backhoven and his uh, uh, senior researcher in his group, Omar Akinbashi, to do some of these bioinformatic analyses. And I was mostly involved in identifying a bunch of these systems and doing this uh, fun um, computational experiment where you randomize the leader and then evaluate its ability to fold with that first repeat, and then compare that to the native sequence, just to see if these hairpins seem to be forming preferentially compared to what you'd get with otherwise random sequences. Okay, oh, so we got to switch around. Um, so what we found, first of all, if you just apply this to systems in which pyogenes falls, you find that you get a lot of these sort of predicted interactions happening more than random sequences, as you can see with all the blue dots here. And so that seemed that at least across this subtype, this was a very, very common phenomenon. Now, if you went to a different subtype of 
these um, systems, you didn't see it as much. And these have a unique way of being able to acquire new spacers and also transcribing their arrays. So probably some different mechanisms there. And then you just don't see, oops, there you go, anything at all as you move on to completely unrelated systems. So the takeaway for us was that this is a mechanism that extends well beyond Streptococcus pyogenes, but not everywhere, suggesting that there's actually other mechanisms at work that would explain um, uh, spacer prioritization as it's commonly observed. And the aside is that if you look into some of these systems that do have predicted hairpins, you just see different variations on a theme, um, including two here from these two A systems, as well as one from one of these two C systems shown here. So you do see these examples, but these structures look very, very different as you go from one to the next. Okay, so to quickly summarize um, what I've uh, described to you today, if you got nothing else out of my time, hopefully you at least appreciate that there is this unique RNA-based mechanism that drives prioritization within immune defense, at least within a, a large set of CRISPR-Cas9 systems. Um, and that it's not only pyogenes, but many systems within one subtype. But then since we don't see this everywhere, but we know spacer prioritization is a thing, there's probably many, many other mechanisms that exist um, that are, remain to be uncovered. So with that, I'll stop here. I definitely want to thank, point out Chun Yu, who did uh, the lion's share of this work, along with a number of really, really nice collaborations, including Rolf, Neva, Cynthia, and Zasha, who I mentioned through the presentation. And then this particular work is being supported through an SPP on CRISPR through DFG, as well as the European Research Council. So with that, I'll stop here and happy to answer any questions as time allows. Thank you very much, Ace. Great talk. All right, so I suggest people to type in their questions in the chat window for now. Uh, until uh, questions start coming up. I just ask a question. I mean, I'm a collaborator, but I just wonder still that how much is known actually in other CRISPR systems about this first leader? Is there anything known whether there are similar structures? So no one has ever looked before, um, which is why we kind of did it out on a whim thinking, oh, the leader, it's not associated with biogenesis. Maybe you get transcription or they have some sequences that drive the acquisition of spatials at that location. So it really came to us as a pretty big surprise. Um, and so, so far we haven't seen any papers that have reported the same, but I can say as we're starting to expand beyond these systems we've looked at, we are seeing this come up. All right, thank you. So more questions? Then I might ask another one. So sure. is it possible that these pseudonauts or the alternative structures forming um, are actually recruiting some, some CRISPR-associated proteins? Do you think there are other things than not only an RNA-mediated thing, but perhaps there are also other proteins? Yeah, yeah, it's a great, another great question. Um, so we, we definitely considered that hypothesis and it still remains within the realm of possibility. Like for instance, maybe if you can recruit Cas9 to that particular location, that's also gonna promote processing. Um, the argument against it, I would say, is that if you look across all of these examples of leader repeat stem loops, they don't share any common sequences or even structures other than having some of these stable stems. And that would argue against having some sort of defined protein RNA interaction that would lend to a conserved sequence or structure. But that's all we have at this stage. I see, great. A lot of things to be discovered. Yes. So we have another question from Leila Leke. Is understanding this system something that can help in furthering the efficacy of CRISPR in multiplexing systems such as Golden Gate assemblies? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So um, to answer um, question, um, we're, 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 I guess anytime you come up with a new discovery in CRISPR biology, there's always the question of, okay, how can we utilize this? Um, for this one, I, I would agree that the biggest opportunity would be in multiplexing and trying to create efficient arrays when you're trying to target multiple genes at a time. Um, so far, CRISPR arrays aren't used with Cas9 in eukaryotic cells. That's why people use sgRNAs. Um, but this would be a really effective approach for bacterial applications. And if we can figure out how prioritization works 
for systems where they do the processing on their own without accessory factors that could be extended to eukaryotic cells. Sorry. Yeah, no problem. Another question, I mean, we have now three, four questions popping up. Um, I'll read them quickly. Um, next one, Frank Slack asking, is space mRNA expression regulated, promoted, or repressed in other systems? Yeah, yeah. So the, the short of it is there are examples, um, although it's not entirely clear across all systems. So in those examples, it's usually linked to some um, set of environmental cues or cellular state in which the cells would be more likely to be under attack by phages. So a common example is quorum sensing, where when you have a really high density of cells, a phage coming in at that point could be really devastating. And so that's when some systems are turned on, um, but other ones just haven't been probed, but there's probably other types of regulation taking place. Mm -hmm. Vicky Leo said guest lab. I don't know what she means. Uh, perhaps you can expand it a little bit, Vicky. And next. Uh, questions from Jacopo Bonis. Great talk, thanks. In your RNA mutants, abolishing the spacer prioritization, what happens to the other spaces in the array? Do they get comparatively upregulated? Yeah, so um, the, the main evidence or data that we have was those RIP-seq experiments where we could try to accurately quantify the relative amounts of those CRISPR RNAs, particularly compared to comparing the native versus the mutated leader. And there, the biggest swing we saw, of course, was for the first CRISPR RNA. And then for the other ones, the changes were much more nuanced. I think this next CRISPR RNA changed by twofold, but then the other ones change anywhere from 1.2 to 0.8. So it's to say that we, we, are, we think we're seeing some adjustments in there, but they're far, far, far less um, than what's happening with the first CRISPR RNA. Okay. All right, thanks, Chase. And before we move on with Emmanuel, last question from Daniel. Do you plan on looking into possible small RNA interactions with the leader? Uh, yeah, so that's an interesting twist in all of this. Um, there's one example of, I believe, a, um, a small RNA that is coming in and regulating some aspect of um, CRISPR RNA biogenesis, albeit through the leader and controlling a transcriptional terminator. Um, but so far, there's just that one example. But especially as we uncover more and more about RNA biology and bacteria, it's easy to imagine that there are other RNA based mechanisms coming into play that people just haven't discovered yet. All right. Thank you so much, Chase, again. And we continue with Emmanuel. Could you try sharing your screen, Manu? Okay, I'll, um, okay our next speaker is uh, Dr. Emmanuel Zaliba. He is uh, a group leader at the Helmholtz Institute for RNA-based infection research in Würzburg. Um, Emmanuel finished his PhD at Institute Curie in 2009 and then joined EMBL as an iPod fellow um, in 2009. And then he started uh, his other postdoctor work in the group of Jörg Vogel where he has started working on uh, single cell RNA sequencing, uh, establishing these techniques. And since 2017, Emmanuel is a, a young investigator at HIRI. And also he has been recently awarded an MO Young Investigator Award since 2020. So please take the way, Emmanuel. Uh, my phone is ringing, sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you. you, thank you. It. It's full screen and you can see it. And yeah, thank you, thank you so thank much, Eva. It's really, it's really a great honor for me to be with you today. And in my laboratory, we, are, we explore infectious diseases at a single cell level. And actually, we use RNA as a, as a molecule to report cellular identity and state. We are really fortunate because RNA has a lot to tell us. And this is what I want to show you and to convince you about uh, today. Before going into the deep science and deep protocols, I want first to take this opportunity to um, explain you our motivation, what is driving us and what is our long-term, um, what is our long-term objective to understand infectious disease. Um, so the, the COVID-19 pandemic caused by SARS-CoV-2 and the recurrent alarm uh, about the increasing rise of uh, antimicrobial resistance remind us in a cruel manner how urgent it is to better understand infectious disease and how much also we lack broad spectrum drugs to tackle those emergent disease. 
Actually, the, the, the picture is pretty worrisome because when we look at recent emerging infectious disease since 1981 to 2021, uh, uh, done by Fauci recently in a, in a very nice review, we see that emerging diseases are heavily distributed all over the world and are constant along this period. So for sure, we will have uh, the next pandemic is, is coming up after COVID and we, we will have to, to tackle it again and face the same problem as we, we face again with, uh, with COVID. Therefore, we need uh, methods to intercept pathogen and juice pathogenicity. And sort of, if we think about it like in a naive way, we would like to have a drug that we take from a shell and intercept the pathogens uh, and in a broad spectrum manner. So pathogens are extraordinary uh, guys because they have an, an amazing ability to escape our immune system. Um, one crucial example is cystic fibrosis when, um, oh, pardon, is it? Um, do you see my pointer here? Yes, so uh, the one example is uh, cystic fibrosis. When a pathogen enter in the lung, it diversifies its behavior depending on the space where it is and adapt to the host and adapt its genome and adapt its function and therefore escape and promote the emergence of antibiotic resistance. And those diseases are extremely difficult to tackle. Another way to adapt to escape our immune system is by transiently developing a phenotype that, uh, that are able to mount antimicrobial resistance. And this is a very uh, extraordinary example provided in Baladon lab where she has put pathogen into microfluidic channel, let them grow, put an antibiotic, and then we see the emergence of just few bacteria that are able to escape the, anti uh, the, the antibiotic and resume growth as they were before. Therefore, tackling this. Um, this pathogen adaptation is a crucial is a, is a crucial challenge in infectious disease, and that's why we need single cell biology to uh, decipher the, the the state and the identity of those pathogens. And when we put those pathogens in the context of something that is that I'm personally extremely interested in, which are chronic infection chronic infections. And when we look at the clinical cause of a chronic infection, the, the infection starts with an acute phase. The pathogen enter, develop, and will be stopped at some point by antibiotic treatment and by the immune system. But a fraction of bacteria are able to escape both of antibiotic and immune system. And at some point, they will here lead to a relapse of infection and again and again. Therefore, we would like to understand in my lab this transition between a persistent infection to the relapse. And we also, the more fundamental question uh, that we ask is whether we can predict from the starting point the development of a chronic infection. And when we put a, now a pathogen in the complexity of a tissue, we see here, for example, a section of a spleen invaded by Salmonella. And we see that every yellow arrow point at a pathogen. And we see that the pathogen is residing in many different areas, either in a very inflammatory state bounded by neutrophils or so somehow pathogens that are lost into macrophages. And so far, this astonishing heterogeneity, we have very little understanding how the disease developed inside the tissue, whether chronic infection is led by those pathogen or those pathogen are controlled by the host. Therefore, we imagine that in future, we need methods that ta target one pathogen at a time. And therefore, the goal of my lab is to understand the key processes that lead to failure in host control of individual lesions. And we are interested in, to, in the lab in three pillars. First, we, we need to enable the technology to decipher host pathogen interaction at a single cell level. 
since we really pioneer this field. Secondly, we use some model and Terica uh, as a model pathogen to understand how antibiotic tolerant subpopulation lead to relapse and if they need to relapse. And finally, we have also a very strong uh, clinical activity to understand respiratory virus in the clinics. And unfortunately, due to time constraint, I won't be able to show you the results we have in there. And instead, focus on the model pathogen, our favorite model pathogen, which is Salmonella tifinoria. So a few words to introduce Salmonella. Uh, it's causing uh, gastro, uh, gastrointestinal infection. And once the bacteria is able to cross the gastrointestinal mucosa layer, it actually enter into phagocytes. And this is really a paradox because when we think about it, like macrophage dendritic cells are phagocytes that are directly, uh, that have been engineered by the immune system to kill the pathogen. Instead, Salmonella, as many other pathogens, use those cells to reside and develop chronic infection. And overall, to put this into the context of the disease, Salmonella is set and all the Salmonella um, strains are kind of causing 1 million deaths. This is debated numbers, but it's, it's a pretty harmful disease. And it's also in the daily lab of infectious disease, like our, it's a very, it's a major model organism to establish new principle of bacteria pathogenicity. And this is, I will illustrate this in the, in the coming slide. So the, the first question that we've been asking ourselves is to try to resolve and to better understand this macrophage paradox. Therefore, we adopted a reduction approaches where we have infected macrophage uh, growing into a tissue culture tube. And, and this is what you see here into this nicely in this picture. Here you have macrophages and they are invaded with different kind of salmonella. So you see that they are here differentiated by their color. And this color comes from a reporter, a recent reporter that report for the growth. So when we infect macrophages uh, on a Petri dish, we see a massive diversification of salmonella behavior inside macrophages. And this happened in only in few, in few hours. Therefore, we wanted to understand how host controls some bacteria, how some other proliferate, and how pesticides shape the host. So we, uh, we adopted a strain, and this is the beauty of Salmonella because it's, easily, it's an easy pathogen that we can engineer. We adopted a, a strain that carry a plasmid uh, with two, with two, color, a two color plasmid, uh, one that is constitutively expressed, that tick for the bacteria, and it's always expressed, and other, another one that is under Arabinose uh, promoter. Therefore, what happened is the principle is uh, pretty simple. The pathogen enter in a macrophage, then the uh, arabinose is no longer available, and the GFP color would be divided by two every generation of replication. Therefore, one color will vanish, and this, by this way, we can report at the single cell level the history of bacterial replication inside a host. And then we can sort for infected cells based on the bacterial replication or not, as illustrated here on this flow cytometry gating. Here we have non-infected cells. Here we have infected cells at time zero. We let the bacteria grow. We see the emergence of the heterogeneity as we have seen before. We get on this, uh, on this window here for macrophages infected with replicating bacteria and macrophages infected with non-growing bacteria as we see here. And we have performed single cell RNA sequencing using SmartSec approach. So to um, very nicely, we could then uh, plot our data in a, what we call a PCA analysis. So for those who are not familiar with this, that we take the whole transcriptome and project it in a 2D, in a 2D map. So the first, dimension here separates the non-naive cells from uh, bystander and infected cells. And uh, so this is an inflammatory response triggered by TLA4, LPS sensing, 
very conventional inflammatory response. But very nicely, actually, we could separate two groups here, one what you call group two and group three, one up there that is dominated by macrophage with non-replicating bacteria and another one dominated by macrophage with replicating bacteria. And when we analyze the genes that were differentiated those two groups, we could find that macrophage with non-replicating bacteria were mainly present in polarized macrophage towards M1, pro-inflammatory macrophages, and another uh, and the one with replicating bacteria were into anti-inflammatory macrophages. So um, we look even more closely the, this, PCA, this PCA analysis, and we could actually find another population of macrophages invaded with non-replicating bacteria that were also adopting an anti-inflammatory macrophages. And this has ring a bell in our head, we thought, okay, there are bacteria that are also able to shift macrophage polarization towards an anti-inflammatory macrophages and reside into anti-inflammatory macrophage as non-replicating bacteria. And those probably are the winner of the game. And this is indeed what we could also demonstrate in a, uh, in a second paper led by Sophie Landlab uh, back when she was in London. Uh, using dual RNA sequencing. So without going into the molecular detail uh, to not overload the presentation, in this slide, we can resume the situation. Like when a salmonella meets a macrophage, it happens that they shift toward anti-inflammatory macrophage, like the, the, the host respond to the, to the infection in a harsh way and raise the alarm to the, that an infection is going on. But actually, a subpopulation of bacteria, uh, either by growing, is able to shift totally the polarization of a macrophage either toward an anti-inflammatory macrophage or the macrophage take control of the bacteria and then the macrophage remain uh, uh, inflammatory or, and this is uh, the winner of, of the game, like persisters, non-growing bacteria are able to secrete an effector to control the polarization change of, of a macrophage. So this is a little bit complex. Uh, I'm sorry for those who are not familiar with uh, macrophage uh, biology, but it shows it's an, ex an exceptional example to show how actively a bacteria manipulate a host. And the take home message is really fascinating because pathogens know cell biology way better than we do. And a salmonella is able to shift totally in only a few hours the polarization of a macrophage. And uh, now starting the lab, we wanted to better understand uh, these processes. And, but we had two challenge, two technological challenges ahead of us. And this is what I want to present in, a, in the coming slide. The first one is how can we capture the transcriptome in such fast changing phenotype? And can we decipher the underlying gene regulatory networks that underlies those host pathogen interaction? The second one is how can we capture the transcriptome of a single bacteria inside a single host cell? So I will, I will show you what we've been developing, the technology we've been developing to tackle the first challenge and the second challenge. So single cell RNA sequencing are extremely powerful because but they provide only a snapshot of cellular state and cannot report for fast and direct transcriptic changes. If you do a perturbation in a delta T time, a gene A in a delta T time uh, will have a, a natural degradation or a natural synthesis. And actually you can end up in a scenario where even under a stimuli, you have, for example, in this case, five copy, five copy and five copy. But when you look actually the ratio between new and old RNA, in this case, you have 60% of, uh, of new RNA in this one, only 3%, and here you have three. As you have a ratio of three between the condition. Like to look at fast transcriptive changes, you need to be able to discriminate between nascent from old RNA. And this is crucial to be able to understand the, the dynamic of, uh, the direct and indirect effect and the dynamic of infection um, 
and the primary target of the pathogen. So that's why we actually adopted a technology based on RNA metabolic labeling uh, that consists in um, incubating host cells with uh, an, um, a nucleotide for SU, a cytosine analog that will be only integrated into nascent RNA. Then when the RNA is purified, this 4SU will actually adopt the property of a cytosine and then will be read by the reverse constructase as, and the reverse constructase as a, will read it as a C and integrate a G. And then in the sequencing, this leads to a mismatch, a T to C mismatch, where the new RNA are labeled with the C, the old RNA are labeled with the T. Therefore, we can distinguish the new RNA and the old RNA. And this is, uh, we collaborated here with uh, uh, the virologist, uh, Lars, who is a pioneer for RNA metabolic labeling, and Florian Erhard, who is a computational biologist. And this work in my lab has been led by, uh, by Tobias to perform to, and to establish this protocol. Like we, we've been able to demonstrate that we can perform single cell RNA sequencing single slam sec at a single cell level. And in this graph, we see all the possible mismatches that arise. And we can see that only when we have 4SU, we can see a predominance of T to C mismatches that are way beyond the ground, uh, the ground noise introduced by the sequencer. Then we, we encapsulated this into, um, um, into a, a, a format where we have single cell slam sec and the bioinformatic suites to be able to deconvolve the new from the old RNA. And this is really into two different, uh, two different publications. So if you want to have the details, you have, you have them here. But overall, to sum this up, this technology allowed to read nascent RNA at the genome scale at a single cell level, provide a time resolution down to a few minutes. We can capture thousands of genes per single cell, on average, in our case, 4,000 here. And for SU, we could also demonstrate that for SU is as efficient, labeling is as efficient as in bulk. So we apply this very nicely to a model system where we have infected fibroblasts with herpes virus at a pretty high MOI 10. And, uh, to, and I want to illustrate here the power of the technology. So when you read the total RNA here, every cell is an infect, every cell is, uh, is marked by, uh, by um, a circle. So here we have non-infected cells that are empty circles and infected cells are uh, the red circles. And the, the percentage of viral RNA in the host cell is shaded by the, the color. When we look at total RNA after two hours of infection, we cannot discriminate the infected from an infected cell. However, when we, uh, when we read the, every gene as a ratio between new to total RNA and apply a PCR analysis, then we can perfectly distinguish infected from non-infected cells, showing that single cell subject is able to very precisely um, delineate fast transcriptomic changes happening in the host that is not able to done at the, using total RNA. Also, without going further into much detail, but it's a single cell subject act as a loop where we can better discriminate down-regulated, up-regulated genes and also delineate transcriptomic, transcriptomic changes and gene regulatory network in regard of uh, a viral, effect, uh, viral load in this case. And we could even see, for example, whether in this case here we have TNF kappa B that is activated way before IRF, uh, 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 IRF signaling. Therefore, it's to, 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 to the take home message here is this single cell stem cell allowed to read fast transcriptomic changes. It's actually a method to do transcriptomic at two different time points simultaneously and to, re and to relate the present state of a cell to the old state of it. And uh, so it captures nascent RNA. We can then quantify the genes with new to total RNA. And we can link the infectious processes and integrate time in infectious processes. So to make an image, this, I like to show this uh, image from 
uh, that came from Ed Mulbridge in the 80s, where, I, where they look at the horse, uh, a horse um, running, and they didn't know whether the horse touched the floor or not. And they uh, use actually different camera and they have image the horse. And now nowadays we can do a GIF out of it, which is very funny. And then we can see indeed the horse running. And that, at that time, it's, it was of course exceptional. They published this in Scientific American, but um, it exactly shows the same concept than single set snapsec by doing snapshot of the infectious process. We can reconstitute the movie of the infection by integrating time into single cell analysis. And this is exactly what uh, a student of mine in my lab, Christoph, is doing in a lab where now he's studying the invasion and the process leading to um, salmonella, moving from either an inflammatory state or an anti-inflammatory state. And we've been doing this in a snapshot manner. And this really, um, uh, it's really a compiling where we see the emergence of the phenotype over time. Then the second challenge, as I said before, was to tackle the transcriptome of single bacteria. Like I like this picture way a lot because you see here a macrophages. The boundary is uh, the, shad, the shaded line here. We see the bacteria and uh, a bacteria contain roughly 100 times less than RNA than uh, an eukaryotic cells. RNA is not pollinated uh, and also bacteria has a very strong protective membrane. So overall, we had to cross all those challenges to tackle here the, the minute amount present inside the bacteria. So the, and the question we wanted to ask is whether we can distinguish two conditions. It's a very basic question. Like we take bacteria in condition one, condition two. Can we distinguish two different conditions reading at RNA? First, what we did is we, we isolated single cell using a fax area. And we could demonstrate that the efficiency of sorting is extremely high up to 98%. For this, we use actually two strains, one fluorescent, one non-fluorescent, and we sorted them uh, one non-fluorescent, one fluorescent, one fluorescent, non-fluorescent, et cetera. And then from by quantifying this and seeing the emergence of the, the colony coming from a single bacteria, we could, we could really evaluate the precision of our sorting. Uh, then we, we took three conditions of salmonella growth. Uh, late stationary phase, bacteria that stay express very little amount of RNA. Then we apply a shock, an aerobic shock or a salt shock. And we copy those conditions from uh, a companion study that is uh, a very key resource in the field of salmonella. That's why salmonella is a very nice model pathogen. We have access to those publicly available resources and we could then probe the probe the, the capacity of, of the protocol we developed to capture efficiently different conditions. We tackled actually this with the protocols that we've taken from uh, a non poly uh protocol, so random primer uh, launch uh, RT called MatQSec, published in 2017 in Nature Method, and uh, where it used a different cycle or various a multiple cycle reverse nutrition to capture as much as possible RNA, policy tailing, and PCR and uh, fragmentation. So to put this and to give you like what we could capture for every single bacteria, we could capture between 100 and 200 genes roughly. And very amazingly, and to our surprise, we could very nicely delineate the three cross the three different stock conditions that we've been studying, like late, late anaerobic and aerobic shock. Then we look at the, uh, whether the genes uh, that we capture could make sense. So we first could delineate those genes and then we actually went to the, uh, went, took every differentiated gene in our study and compared to the benchmark study, whether they were up or down regulated and actually could confirm that in the benchmark studies, those genes that we were that were upregulated were also upregulated in uh, in our study. So we could really make the case that we can capture RNA from a single bacteria, and this those RNA report for the state of a bacteria. So it sounds very primitive, but we had to do it. 
And uh, so therefore, condition A, condition B, we sort single vector, we apply the protocol we've engineered, and yes, we can different distinguish condition A from condition B. Meanwhile, other groups uh, have also published single vector RNA sequencing, and uh, all this came in 2020. 2020 was the year for single bacteria RNA sequencing coming from different labs. Very nice to see also that our uh, results were all together pretty robust and going in the same direction. And I want to and I want to highlight the work from other labs here. Therefore, like now the, the big challenge over the next year will be to be able to take, for example, a microbiome and get this into a sort of factory, single cell factory. But again, every bacteria has its own challenge and we are really uh, far down the road. Uh, in the future, what we would like to do then is to, to have a sort of infection atlas where we start from the pathogen niche. We model the host pathogen interaction. We place every pathogen inside its space, but also to understand how a whole organ is reorganized by infectious processes. And so we have, uh, we, we start to create what we call the infection atlas.com, which will be a platform in the future that allows us to tackle for that allows us to tackle all these different time scale, like sort of Google map for infection, where we go and, and see the, see the infect, every infected cells. And so that now that we have all the technologies that allow to do it, so it should be, it should be feasible. Finally, I also want to just also to say that over the last year, we've been extremely involved in understanding the dysfunctional myeloid response to severe ARDS COVID-19 patients uh, what we call severe, that are uh, uh, COVID-19 patients who are under oxygenation uh, that rank between six to eight in the WHO ordinate uh, scale. And we've been first probing the blood and we also been extremely active in understanding the lung damage, the lung damage created by COVID infection. And this is a lung from a severe COVID-19 patient that we've been analyzing We've been understanding the dysfunctional of myeloid cells into the lung. Uh, and this is a work led by uh, my student. Unfortunately, I cannot present this, this work here. And I wanted to focus here on in this seminar on not on the clinics, but on the fundamental aspect uh, of uh, RNA. But I wanted to highlight here the very nice work done by, by Oliver in my lab. Uh, finally, I want to uh, thank my, uh, my lab and um, for the work they do every day, my uh, technician, technical assistant to the lab. And I just here highlight a few of the collaborators that, that have shown, uh, that have been highly involved in the story I've shown, like uh, York, Sophie, Florian and Lars, and the amazing supports that I received from the core system meeting here with uh, Yota. So thank you very much for your attention, and I will be very very happy to to have your to have your to have questions from you guys. Thanks very much, Emmanuel. That was a really great summary of all work you're doing. Amazing stuff. Um, we have one question from Yunji We I hope I pronounced it correctly. Is it possible to detect SNPs in your uh, single cell slam sec analysis? How could you differentiate from the T2C mutation caused by 4 tio u Like whether you can, um, yes, yeah, it's exceed way beyond every SNPs, like the integration of 4SU allowed you to, to, distinguish, to distinguish these. So the integration of 4SU is pretty rare in the transcript, but the, the models that are developed in the Grand Slam program allow you to distinguish to distinguish them pretty well. And how much is the uh, how much is the efficiency of this tire you labeling? Uh, the conversion of uh, for SU or right. the conversion is, is very high, mm -hmm. close to more than ninety five percent reported in the initial nature nature method paper. Mm -hmm. But uh, the integration itself is pretty rare uh, is very it's pretty rare that's why you need this method you also need long reads like illumina long reads to to be able to read uh, uh, to be able to capture those uh, those mismatches I and see. to call them and to call them properly 
indeed. Yeah. But they are still higher than the SNPs. Yes. All right. Um, I have a, a question, but before the one from Austin Herberts uh, is asking: Is there a detectable change in pathogen in these alternative splicing events in the ACRNA sec data? Uh, sorry, I didn't get the question. Is there a detectable change in pathogen induced splicing events, alternative splicing events in the SCRNA sec data? Do you see any changes in alternative splicing? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, we we are not here yet. Like this will be the next challenge to combine uh, reading the nascent RNA and splice and unsplice. We, we capture splice and then splice, and we've been in the paper, we've been applying the velocity models mm -hmm. to try to model the trajectory of a cell. We are, we are at really early st stage for, for that. Uh, and that's, uh, um, we actually need a method that goes and fish RNA in a non polyadulated. Uh, independent manner. Mm -hmm. and, and then to have really a robust protocol for doing this and possibly reverse transcriptors that can capture long reads. So way longer than the reverse transcriptors that we are currently using. This is something we are tackling uh, nowadays in the lab. Great. I have a question, Emmanuel. Um, what do you think about the labeling? How does it change actually? Um, other things like translation, because this labeling takes, I believe, about an hour, where normal cellular processes should also be happening, right? No, you. Uh, the How uptake, long is this treatment for tire U labeling? Yeah, the uptake. Like the uptake what, right. What's, the, what's the, the time of uptake? Yes, uh, uh, good question. Uh, we we don't know we don't know exactly the kinetic of. Uh, for SU uptake. Mm -hmm. I think, I presume it will vary from one cell to the other. Like if we sample, if we sample cells over time, maybe people have already done it, I don't know, uh, but they can, they can see the integration of for SU and the efficiency of for SU integration. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe don't have the data. Right, because maybe it might change also translation or other um, NMD cellular surveillance pathways beyond infection, maybe are also the so, such. Yes, that's, that's a good question. So we, we check for, we always, before embarking on those experiments, we check also for uh, very strictly that the 4SU does not induce some RNA dysregulation, RNA shut, um, transcriptomic shutdown and things like this. So normally we consider it as pretty, to be a pretty neutral process. All right. I see no um, urgent questions in the chat window. Uh, you can always um, reach out to our speakers um, by their emails. Um, yeah, I would like to thank you again for your attention and take our speakers, Emmanuel and Chase, as well as Tim Schneider for his help in organizing this. So see you next time. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Neva. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Ciao.